On September 27, 2002, Belding Schribner was awarded the Albert Lasker Award for Clinical Medical Research for the development of renal hemodialysis. Belding Schribner is interviewed by Eric B. Larson, Medical Director of the University of Washington Medical Center. Good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Eric Larson. I'm the Medical Director of the University of Washington Medical Center, uh, formerly University Hospital in Seattle on the campus of the University of Washington. Today I'm in the home of Elding and Ethel Scribner in a houseboat uh, on Portage Bay, a uh, beautiful fall day in Seattle. And I'm here to speak with uh, Dr. Belding Scribner, who recently won the Lasker Award for his work in the development of uh, kidney uh, dialysis or uh, hemodialysis. Uh, Scrib and I have known each other uh, for as long as I've been in Seattle, which was about 1975, and I've known of his work uh, since before uh, I came to Seattle. Uh, it's a bit of a legend in the development of uh, medical technology and life-saving medical technology. Uh, for starters, Scrib, why don't we say a few words, or why don't you say a few words about it, what it must have been like to take care of patients with kidney failure uh, before the development of the Scribner shunt? Well, uh, it was a harrowing experience, and I, I, I think that uh, th those harrowing experiences were a great part of the story of how we got started. We had this man from Spokane that was sent over as reversible renal failure and responded beautifully to dialysis in a couple of days he was up walking around and just looking great and then we did a renal biopsy which is to take a piece of the kidney and look at it and it turned out he had uh, rapidly progressive GN and he was going to die and uh, so we sent him back to Spokane and uh, uh, that was the end of that but uh, we didn't actually see him die on thank goodness but uh, it was that experience that caused me to wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh my God, maybe we can do something about that. And uh, that was how the shunt was, the idea was born. So it, uh, it was out of those experiences that, it, that the shunt was born. And that was here at University Hospital? Oh yeah. Oh, and yeah. about when did that happen? 1960. Really? Yeah. Oh. I think the hospital hadn't been open for long. Two years. The hospital was open for two <laughs> years at that time, so that was right at the very beginning. Yeah. How did uh, how did you approach the problem? How did you begin to think about uh, long-term hemodialysis? Well, I uh, I just thought of the shunt. I mean, uh, you know, you'd used uh, uh, vessels each time to do a dialysis, and indeed on him we used. I think we dialyzed him three times and used three separate arteries and veins and uh, I just suddenly said well heck if we can use a shunt and permanently cannulate an artery and a vein maybe we can keep people going for a long time. And hadn't people thought of that before? That seems yeah, fairly obvious. It's uh, uh, Niels Alvall in Lund, Sweden had thought of the idea in, in 49 uh, but uh, we had the good fortune at the time that DuPont had just uh, come on the market with Teflon tubing and uh, he had used glass and couldn't keep it open. So the, the real secret was that it was the Teflon tubing that, and I just by chance discovered that uh, as you, you know the story where I was met uh, uh, what's the name of the surgeon? Uh, Lauren. Lauren Wintershine. <laughs> on the uh, stairs, and uh, uh, he said, "Have you ever heard of Teflon? I hear you guys are working with an implant. Have you ever heard of Teflon?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, go down and look at the coil of it in uh, Central Service, and and it uh, there it was. It was an electrical contractor, great roll of this stuff." And uh, they had selected it apparently for the right uh, to try it on on uh, experimental situations, and it worked. And uh, Quentin, the engineer, learned how to bend it and uh, and form it, and we had the shot. How did you and Quentin 
hook up? Were you working he was, on this together he, no, originally? Originally, he was just happened to be at the U, uh, head of the medical instrument shop, and just happened to be skillful in these kinds of things. And then Dave Dillard was the surgeon, and he was a very patient guy. And uh, uh -huh. uh, we put the shunt in uh, one patient, uh, a patient with acute renal failure, uh, just to you know to try it because it couldn't do any harm, and uh, uh, it worked for a couple of days. And so at that time, it just again just happened that Clyde Shields, a machinist from Boeing, was dying of uremia in our clinic, and we put it in on March 9th, 1960, and, and that was the rest of his history. Yeah. Well, not really. There's so many medical problems <laughs> came up. <laughs> well, <laughs> what was it about Teflon that distinguished it from glass in terms of solving the problems uh, of uh, uh, why the solution didn't work in Sweden but d happened to work in Seattle? Well, Teflon was a ideal non-stick surface that didn't react with the clotting mechanism in the blood and uh, was and it turned out uh, that Teflon was a poor choice and later we went to uh, a silicone uh, that had laid we were right at the time uh, that all these things were coming out from technical technical side mm -hmm. so we lucked out then and of course the whole thing was made um, irrelevant by uh, uh, the guys in the Brooklyn that developed the AV fistula, where you just sew an artery to a vein right. at, the, right. at the wrist and use the natural vessels. Yeah, but the, the idea was that before these synthetic materials, uh, we didn't have anything that would prevent uh, the blood from clotting, and essentially the device yeah. would right. be useless. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So it was just, in a way, a series of lucky steps. Well, I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just the beginning. Yeah. I mean, we then ran into a horrendous number of diseases that uh, Clyde uh, was the first, and he lost his renal function rather quickly. Uh, he had fairly rapid progressive disease, so he developed all these diseases, gout, so, well, you're first going to die of malignant hypertension, and we cured that by taking salt out of him, you know, uh, mm -hmm. reducing his ECV, and then he developed gout, and uh, his, he had classic gout with a mm -hmm. big toe, and we cured that by upping the dose of dialysis, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, Clyde lived... Eleven years. Eleven years. Yeah. And uh, he would have died without this. Did he eventually get a... Uh, A.V. Fistula, or did he uh, use the I, Scribner yeah, shunt for I years? I think he probably got, I don't I actually uh -huh. remember yeah. that, uh -huh. but uh, he he did amazingly well for number one. Yeah, and so so the, the c combination of good fortune and just the right people coming together to solve a, uh, a technical problem, if you will, once the the biology had been worked out, before was that was the key to the solution then well right plus uh, a lot of imagination and how to treat things like mm -hmm. uh, hypertension nobody had ever figured out that you could uh, actually treat hypertension by just taking down the ECV it was mm -hmm. well known but we had to go mm -hmm. to the literature and figure that out and then demonstrate that it could be done yeah. Do you want to? Uh, I've heard a story about when you presented the results of the first several cases using the Scribner shunt at the Atlantic City meetings. Is that a. Uh, well, that can you tell a, the story uh, and tell me if it's a true story? Oh, it's a true story. What happened? Well, we had presented. Uh, uh, actually, we presented the first thing. Uh, it was in Chicago, but it was the American Society for Artificial Organs, and so there was no no press coverage or anything. And we didn't want any because it was so early on in the game. But after a couple of years, we decided to submit an abstract to the uh, American Society of Clinical Investigation, which met on that steel pier in Atlantic mm -hmm. City, mm -hmm. and uh, where they used the uh, 
the auditorium for a scientific meeting in the daytime and a burlesque show at night. Right. I remember walking out on that. So that's where I that's why I gave my first real presentation and it's this very staid society and uh, after, uh, just by chance the guy that preceded me on the program was talking about some very obscure transport system or something and so I gave this talk and showed a picture of um, Jim Alvers uh, who had uh, finished his PhD on uh, in physics while he was a patient and the whole thing ended with a standing ovation. They'd never had one before and it was just uh, people were cheering and everything and it was just unbelievable. It's like the first performance of the Messiah in the Hallelujah <laughs> Chorus, right? I don't the know. king stood up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was very exciting. Yeah. And, uh, uh, totally unexpected. I mean, I just did. I didn't know what was going to happen. What did you do? Just sort of sneak off the stage, <laughs> no, or no, uh, I, I stand there and I, smile? I, I stood there and smiled. And, yeah. And uh, then I got suddenly, uh, from going from no dealings with anybody to dealings with the press, and I, I had interviews with the New York Times and Herald Tribune, which was going in those days. And then soon after that, the Life magazine mm -hmm. people got came to Seattle. And when they came to Seattle, we thought they wanted to talk to Harvey and Clyde and all the patients. No way. Uh, Shane Alexander wanted to talk to this committee. And so that's where that uh, mm -hmm. that whole story came from. We should probably backtrack a little bit and, and uh, talk about the committee and how that started and yeah. and the kind of problems you had outside of the standing ovations yeah. and accolades. <laughs> well, that was, the, that was, uh, anyway, the committee, uh, my colleagues all said that uh, I had invented the committee and I didn't at all. Dean Jim Haviland, and uh, what I did was say we, uh, we got this grant from the John A. Hartford Foundation to open a, a clinical center at, uh, to demonstrate the community feasibility of the technique. And uh, uh, we had to figure out how we were going to select the patients because the pressure, of course, was absolutely enormous. And I took the problem to the King County Medical Society and, uh, and Jim Haviland just happened to be the president that year and, and he and the and the society devised the uh, the uh, whole f uh, method, uh, the medical committee first, and then uh, the lay uh, committee uh, to make the final selection. And uh, this was uh, widely criticized afterward. But the the problem, just in a word, was you were faced with impossible more people choices. Yeah. that whose lives could be saved than yeah. there were. All oh, right. Take us on the train, if you will. Yeah. Uh, the first thing the committee or the King County Medical Society did when they tackled this problem was to say that you had to be a resident of the state of Washington to qualify, and uh, that was the first thing they did, and then they went on from there. Hmm. And how, what what was it like? I mean, you basically, uh, you were you on the committee, or was no, the no, I, totally I, independent I, of the I, totally independent of, uh -huh. of the university. It was the downtown center they were picking for. We were we were uh, forbidden. I got in a big fight with John Hogness about saving uh, one patient who was my own patient and. Uh, they said, okay, you can keep him at the U until the center opens. And, uh, but it was entirely separate from the U. And the, the committee would be, uh, if you will, a kind of a, I remember the Life magazine article, they yeah. showed people without faces. They were right. in, in, yeah. uh, in and silhouette. They, they, the people would be referred to the center. The word got around, of course, very quickly that, that uh, you could try for this and uh, so we had uh, people uh, applying
find to the to the medical committee, and then if they pass that, then they go on to the to the lay committee. So the medical committee would rule uh, that this is a sort of a medically ideal suitable ideal candidate. candidate. That I mean, they just cut it off. For instance, no nobody over forty-five, and so mm -hmm. on and so on. Very strict. Mm -hmm. And they were flooded with with applicants even at that mm -hmm. that rate. From all over the country. No, we had uh, we. That's why. <laughs> so they, the, so the just state the state of Washington, Washington right? But, but there must have been people oh, all over the country. Uh, well, the well they, were, they were trying. Right? Yeah, sure. And yeah. then the subsequent committee would just basically judge uh, people. Uh, well, uh, the the criticism afterward. Or d c concurrent, the next few years was just, just uh, horrendous. You know, mm -hmm. somebody said, "Well, uh, Pablo Picasso never could have made it by that committee," and uh -huh. uh, on and on. It was all in the legal uh -huh. literature that this happened. Uh -huh. but, uh, actually, according to um, uh, I forget think of his name now, but he wrote a book and and said this was the beginning of bioethics, the birth of bioethics. Huh. Well, yeah. You know the guy that just left. Al Johnson. Al Johnson. Yeah, sure. Did. Yeah, we talk a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it was an attempt to make the process at least somewhat independent and uh, and fair. I yeah, guess is, that, is the way I'd put it. There, you wouldn't get something because you were the governor of a state or right. Or, that that or, was the idea, yeah. and uh, of course it wasn't fair at all. But it was the best we could do, and. Uh -huh. uh, it's a problem that's come up. It's really coming back to into four yeah. now, as as we get more and more of these kinds of decisions. Right, and limited supply of right. organs for transplants yeah, and right. so forth. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, how did the development of dialysis here? You know, there's the there's the all the medical sort of problems that you had to. Right. Surmount the gout and the uh, calcium right. uh, phosphate uh, deposition diseases and what have you, uh, and that must have been a kind of an exciting time to discover all these new things that were occurring as people lived longer uh, uh, with an artificial kidney. Well, it it was. I mean, uh, every year we'd get, there was no lack of. Of subjects to talk about when we went to the annual meeting of the Artificial Organ Society. Uh -huh. and first, it was, as you mentioned, the calcium and then the gout and then the first the hypertension and so on. So, uh, But the thing that has stuck over the years that we parted ways with the world or the particularly the United States was the dose of dialysis. and. Um, it became evident as time went on that the dose of dialysis was crucial to the well-being of the patient, and under dialysis to this day is a is a problem mm -hmm. uh, because it's cheaper, and uh, also the patients like it more when they can do a short dialysis, and uh, nothing could be. Worse for their well-being than doing a short dialysis, and just in the last few years, uh, Perotis, particularly in in Canada, has shown that uh, doing dialysis seven days a week overnight while you sleep, these people are normal. Mm -hmm. You can't tell them from a normal individual. Yeah. Now doing it at home while you sleep, that's not a trivial statement. No, no. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> well, he, uh, I don't know what kind of equipment he uses, but we we did that early on. Uh, of course, Les Babb came into the picture in 65, and uh, um, that's a good story. I just went, walked across that bridge, you know, and yeah. gave a lecture at the engineering school, and uh, one of their grand rounds, like, uh -huh. Gatherings, and he was the one guy that called me after the lecture, and and he invented the home dialysis machine mm -hmm. in about six months. Hmm. He had a, a, a friend whose daughter was dying and had been rejected by the committee, and uh, uh, she uh, he said, "I'm going to 
build a machine and save her, and he did. My goodness. Just like that? Just like that. Uh. He'd already built the monster, which mm -hmm. was uh, proportioning dialysate, and uh, we'd had the bath uh, concept where they'd mix the chemicals in the mm -hmm. bath, and he made a, a proportioning system where you have concentrated chemicals and you mix it with water, and that gives you an endless supply. And then he miniaturized that. Hmm. And uh, it's too bad we didn't have a patent policy then, because yeah. if he had patented that, it would have been just like the patents on vitamin D at the University of Wisconsin. Uh -huh. it would, this place would be rolling in dough. I don't think we thought that way in those <laughs> days, did we? we? No. no, not quite. <laughs> Th th to me, that's the other thing that is really interesting about this story is the, the sort of public uh, give back and spiritedness with which uh, dialysis was developed. Because uh, we we have a very interesting setup of, of dialysis centers and a home dialysis program, both with uh, traditional hemodialysis, but also I recall peritoneal dialysis. Uh, you want to say a little bit about how that well, evolved? Well, peritoneal dialysis uh, arrived in the form of uh, uh, Fred Boone, who was doing it uh, in the Netherlands and decided he'd like to come to Seattle and work. And uh, he was responsible for developing the uh, first peritoneal program. The problem with peritoneal was that whatever you did, you always got peritonitis. Mm -hmm. And so he decided to uh, try doing peritoneal dialysis by putting the catheter in for each dialysis called the single stick method. And uh, he proved that peritoneal dialysis worked. And uh, that led to that uh, infamous Factory under the in the basement of the university hospital, mm -hmm. and then Henry Tenkoff mm -hmm. was his fellow, and he developed the Tenkoff catheter, which was a tunneled catheter that uh, uh, made it possible to do long-term peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. And then a graduate of ours uh, went down to Texas and developed CAPD, which is where they do it continuously and. Uh, uh, change the bottles, and uh, we've had patients come here and sit and talk to me and change their bottles while they're doing that, while they're here. So CAPD is continuous ambulatory Patient, per peritoneal dialysis. That's right, right, and that was developed by I can't remember his name, but he went down. He trained with Les and went down to uh -huh. Texas and got uh, together with a guy yeah. in Austin and yeah. did it. But this gives people back their lives and, yeah. and they spend oh, their yeah. lives at home rather than yeah. in a center all the time. Yeah. Yeah. How how uh say a little bit about the 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 maybe the commerce, the business aspects of the center concept that we have and that developed in Puget Sound and, and the other ways that dialysis has developed around the country. Uh there's uh when it when it uh, when the Medicare law was passed in seventy or seventy one giving the patients making the patients eligible for Medicare uh, there came right with that this uh, business scheme to sell dialysis to Medicare and uh, those guys became billionaires it was uh, a company called national medical care and uh, they did a good job at, at first, but they they cut corners and uh, made short dialysis uh, their their operating road, and uh, so they've underdialyzed uh, the vast portion of the United States patients since since 1970 because of the economic uh, you know the bottom line comes right. first kind of thing. I mean, it's more complicated than that. Yeah, but, but how, how is it that, uh, you might want to explain what yeah. the situation is like here in, in, in Puget Sound and the Scribner Center and some of the other centers around the area. Well, uh, it, it, uh, 
is uh, at the Northwest Kidney Center. They try to dialyze as long as they can. Five hours is the max, mm -hmm. and uh, but they tend to start out that way instead of starting with three hours and then as the patient's kidney function goes uh, they build up the time mm -hmm. and uh, then they get to under dialysis and there are there even here under the operating load of an incentric uh, care they can't really give an adequate dose of mm -hmm. dialysis but they come close here and uh, the only real answer is uh, overnight, the way it's done in France. Mm -hmm. uh, this unit in France has the best survival record in the world, and mm. uh, they do it overnight there, mm. three times a week. Or what's the latest thing? This, uh, some people in Italy and uh, started it, and uh, followed by Pirotis in uh, in uh, Toronto and. Uh, forgotten his name in Virginia. Uh -huh. they're, they're doing it at home seven nights a week. And then the latest thing is very exciting. It's doing it two hours a day during the day at home. Huh. And that's working amazingly well. So frequency is, has emerged as the key variable that needs to be mm -hmm. worked into the system. So it becomes more like the kidney work 24 hours a day. Yeah, and the closer a, you can get to that, yeah, the right, dialysis, yeah. the better. Is so people that are on a couple of hours now, uh -huh. on a couple of hours, a couple of times a day, I mean, seven, six, seven days a week are doing beautifully. Yeah, that's wonderful. So that's, uh, that's the latest future. And of course, the real future is with transplant, I mean. Yeah. And that's evolved from, uh, as you know, the very primitive uh, twin uh, mm -hmm. transplants to... And one of the reasons that we were um, had so many patients was that when we started, we didn't have a transplant surgeon. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, I've forgotten exactly which year Tom Mercier yeah. came, and he had, How can you forget? Huh? And, oh, yeah, <laughs> Tom, was, Tom was great. And uh, he had all these patients stacked up waiting, so yeah. he was operating like crazy. Yeah, he was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heaven, right. <laughs> The surgeon who reads the Lancet. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that, sure. Um, how did the Northwest Kidney Centers get started? Well, that was part of the committee business. That was the grant from the Hartford Foundation uh -huh. that gave a three-year grant of uh -huh. $100,000 a year to start the kidney center. And uh, that's when I, we started it because, I mean, I went to the Hartford Foundation. The NIH didn't want to get into the delivery business, right. so I went to the, heard about the Hartford Foundation, and Mr. E.P. Roy, at the, mm -hmm. who is a great guy, that's the A&P, mm -hmm. right. the, the Hartford that Foundation, yeah. and so he gave us the money, and uh, then that's when I went to the King County Medical Society and said, you guys have to figure out how to set up the admissions to the, to the Seattle right. Artificial Kidney Center, which later became the Northwest Kidney Center. And that was originally a university hospital? No, no, it was, it, was, it was built in a little three-bed unit in the courtyard of Swedish Hospital, uh -huh. right f fronting on Bourne Avenue. Oh, sure, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> right. about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was a freestanding, not-for-profit? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, venture, right. if you will. And, the, and, and how is what's happened to the kidney center since then? Well, it's grown and moved two uh, or three times, and uh, now is funded by Medicare, yeah. basically. And but it still maintains its not-for-profit, yeah, kind of and community uh, service. That's right. Ideal, and, uh, and uh, it it I I'm prejudiced, of course, but most people who've been there would say it's still number one in the world. I would say that <laughs> one of the one of the centers is has your name, I think, right? So you've got to got to be proud of that. The Scribner Center. Oh, that's just a, a little branch thing out yeah. in Northgate. Yeah. Uh, and what t t tell the people what what that's like today as a place like the Scribner Center. Well, it's a uh, uh, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't looked at it that carefully. <laughs> so but it's a nice, it's a nice facility. Oh yeah, it stands yeah. close to the community where people live. That's right. 
and uh, it's it's run it by serves professionals. The North End and it's yeah. run by this particular one's run by the university. Yeah. Although it's part of the Northwest Kidney Center system, it's run by the by Suel Ahmad and yeah. uh, his yeah. colleagues at the U. Yeah, and and I think the thing that strikes me is, and I was kind of leading this discussion a bit, but uh, th this is a, almost like a public good in our community, uh, and th there's there's not a there's not there's an incentive to cover your costs, but right. you're not going to return your money to the shareholders. You're basically returning right. your money to develop the, you know, to replace the the lights uh, uh, fixtures or the technology of dialysis as it changes. Right. And, uh, but uh, the, the cost ratio, or whatever they call it now, is getting so tight that uh, even the non for everybody's basically. everybody's it's a you know, it's part of the national right, crisis. right, right. Yeah. Uh, do you have um, any thoughts about uh, why you know this happened? What did you bring to the to the to the table in in terms of developing this, uh, and, and be modest or, or not, depending on how you feel, uh, in the development of the of the shunt, and then of course in the subsequent development of all the things that happened, once we knew we could do long term mm -hmm. hemodialysis. I, I I don't have much to say. I I just did my thing. I I, I, I was amazed. I I just read a. a a chapter from a book written by somebody else about what I did, and I am amazed that of some of the things they said I did that they were right. And I, but uh, basically, I just uh, uh, worked on the patients, and we had such horrendous medical problems that I just spent my all my time concentrating on how do you solve hypertension, gout. Uh, Peripheral neuropathy was a big problem, and so on. So it was, and then the engineering took an enormous communication effort to bring the engineers up to up to speed. And luckily, Les Babb was a good listener and uh, grasped the problems quickly. Uh -huh. And uh, so everything was kind of problem solving. It sounds like right. using your mind and what you knew about biology and medicine, but also bringing in people. That's there. right. In some ways, before and luckily they I had a, I had a, a real strength in, uh, in my, my expertise is in fluid and electrolyte balance. Right. And in fact, I taught the course, over here for years uh -huh. in fluid and electrolyte balance. And of course, much of what you do when you do, do dialysis is to correct fluid and electrolyte problems. Mm -hmm. So we knew, I knew instinctively how to go about. Uh, Correcting the acidosis and how the problems of going too far, or too less, and so on. So I had good background in my training in that just by chance. Mm -hmm. So you sat more or less in the center of the of the gamish of of uh, the problems came yeah. from the patient, and we looked for people in various areas. That's right. to, to I remember out. one one time, uh, you know. Uh, Ed Krebs, who was a Nobel laureate, and uh, we were, we were, um, what was it? We were, oh, I know, we were uh, trying to uh, change the composition of the dialysis fluid so it could be pumped by Babs' machine, the chemistry, and the the standard. Uh, source of bicarbonate in those days was Hartman's solution, which contained lactate. Mm -hmm. And we knew that lactate wouldn't metabolize very well. So one day, uh, Charles Mio, a fellow from France, uh, trotted over the, the, down those long halls mm -hmm. and uh, talked to Ed Krebs and said, Now, if you were building this machine, what ion would you select? That would be rapidly metabolized, and he didn't think but thirty seconds and said acetate. So acetate became the standard uh, chemical as mm -hmm. a source of bicarbonate in mm -hmm. dialysis. Mm -hmm. So we got you know being in the center of a great university like this, it was 
That's what you did. You walked down the you walked hall and got the right answer. answer. Yeah. Especially if you knocked on the right door. Yeah, you know, right. You're smart enough to knock on the right door. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful story. And there are probably just thousands of stories like that. Well, I you know, and there, there are lots uh, of others, right? Yeah. Now, you've worked on other artificial organs. Uh, I remember when I was chief resident, you were working on the artificial gut. You know, I don't know whatever happened to the artificial gut. They don't have a journal. They don't have anything. You know, when we worked on it, the GI people were absolutely dead set against the concept. They didn't want anything to do with it. Hmm. Did you know that? No, nope, never heard that. And so, uh, well, let me explain a little what the artificial yeah. gut is. It really is... Uh, home parental nutrition, mm -hmm. and we had the access f for a dialysis, and all we did was plug a sidearm into our access and infuse 50% dextrose as a source of fluid and amino acids as a source of protein into the shunt, and you have an artificial gut. And that was, it was just a silly, or not silly, but a that's we, we, it seems simple once you thought of it. Yeah, right, like once you of thought things. of it. And, of course, the GI people hated it. Yeah. They hated calling it the artificial gut. So it, it later we called uh, home parental nutrition. Mm -hmm. But uh, they wanted no part of it. And so we, were, we accumulated a lot of patients, mainly with Crohn's disease in the Department of Kidney Disease. And finally, we just said we can't cope with this anymore. And we went to the GI people, and they didn't want any part of it. So that's how it got into uh, the endocrinology. Mm -hmm. you know, endocrinology, I don't know how many they manage still, but they have a department of, of parental nutrition and right. endocrinology because right. they, they agreed to take it. Well, I think there's an area where probably it's just so almost commonplace, not that all the problems are solved, yeah. but many of them are are solved uh, and so you know I know we have uh, pre-printed orders now at the hospital and uh, in many cases the doctor isn't even involved mm -hmm. with that aspect of, of, uh, right. of the care they may have, once they it's may established. Have simplified it and the point home where, yeah. visiting nurses right. and and, uh, and uh, uh, infusion supply companies now just yeah. manage that but uh, it's another advance that happened yeah. here at University right. Hospital under your leadership yeah Remember Don? Was it Don Miller that was involved? Oh, uh, uh, can't remember the guy's name. Yeah. There were so many. Yeah, but he, he <laughs> had these very sick patients. I remember they'd come in, looking like they'd come out of a concentration camp, and right. then three to four weeks later, they <laughs> looked like normal human beings again. It was kind of like, probably yeah. a little bit like this, the days of dialysis. When well, in a way, it was even more dramatic because yeah. the first patients we got were just cadavers practically. Yeah. And and then within a month, they were starting to get their strength back, and mm -hmm. it was just it was totally remarkable. Mm -hmm. Well, now uh, we're looking at your uh, uh, looking at a man rowing his skull here. Uh, you want to tell some fun stories about getting to work and, oh. and losing your canoe and any of these oh. other things that have happened to you over the years? Yeah, well, I did used to, since the university is right over there, I used to commute by canoe. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the regents was, I um, can't think of his name, but anyway, I'll think of it. He thought it was a good idea to do ads for the University of Washington and the, sort of the punchline, you get something mm -hmm. out of it whether you go there or not. And one of the ads was me paddling to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it was in the 1970s and was shown on all the television programs. And then uh, people got interested in my canoes and started to steal them. And I, I, the one I used in the picture uh, in the ad was a beautiful... 50-year-old Old Town canoe, and that was stolen first, and then somebody gave me a brand new, beautiful cedar Old Town canoe, mm -hmm. and that was stolen. And then I tried a couple of aluminum canoes, and finally I had to give up and, and switch to a motorboat, because they, they just kept stealing the canoes. And they never came back. Huh? They never came back. <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> and you used to... Such you, is the you, price would, of would you, fame. Yeah, you know? right. Would you wear your... Uh, didn't you used to wear a red? Uh, oh yeah, I wear a red hat. Red yeah. hat and yeah. uh, kind of a, a 
French hat of some sort. No, it's just a red cap. Red yeah, cap. Yeah. You probably still have that. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah there, there it is. There. there it is. Yeah, the red hat. So <laughs> it's great. Um, are there other things that you'd like to just sort of record for posterity on this <laughs> uh, on this tape? Uh, uh, just the fact that uh, uh, somehow it, uh, we have to get back more into balance in terms of uh, how to uh, the, 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 the scar on my on my memory is this uh, effect of profit taking in that I'm not against profits but it was just became so ludicrous and at the expense of the patient mm -hmm. and it was the forerunner of all the problems we have with HMOs and all that I don't really understand it anymore, mm -hmm. but the the worst, one of the worst and earliest examples was the profiteering in dialysis. Yeah, and uh, I just hope that, that some way can be found to to not have that recur. Well, I I and I I just would add that I think you and the people that had and maybe the foundation had something to do with this in terms of setting it up so that you could put this into a public good utility kind of mode yeah. as opposed to the way it was in so many cities where people Well that was done before you see the the city the, the, the this we we had been in operation and there were some centers going mm -hmm. that had been picked by the government mm -hmm. as trial centers uh, but once the medicare thing was passed that's when the Price. Companies got going and, yeah. and figured out the best way to make money was to run patients through as fast as you can, right. which is fine for the bottom line, but just the wrong thing for the for the health of the patient. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for uh, a young scientist who who might be starting out based on your uh, journey of discovery, if you will? Uh, I think it's it's awfully tough now because. Uh, science has, has really come to a new level of at the molecular and submolecular level and uh, I'm not saying that all the things that in the area that we worked in which was technical advance and uh, have been done but uh, uh, I'd say it'd, it'd be tough now to to do another sequence like this mm -hmm. Well, there may be another frontier, though. Maybe we're looking well, at technology to replace, say, the things w when the brain fail fails. What can we? Well, uh, that's th that. Now you're t now that's right. I mean, that, there may be all kinds of things in those areas, but you're more attuned to those things <laughs> than I am. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, <sighs> you you strike me as a person though who who kept an open mind as you approached your problems. If if somebody walked up to you and said. Teflon, you didn't say you got to be kidding, right? No. What no, did you no. say? Well, I, 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 I said, my God, I, I don't know what I said, but anyway, it worked. Yeah. But you, <laughs> you, you at least were open yeah. to the possibilities. Yeah. And I, I think the thing that I've learned from you is 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 to keep an open mind, uh, because if we keep our minds open when we're solving problems, yeah. we probably have a better chance of solving them. That's but, right. Uh, I, I, I can't agree more on that. Yeah. You're the same way, from what I've heard. Well, you taught me. No, I didn't. You taught a lot of us that. No. <laughs> well, it's been just fantastic to have this conversation together, and uh, not only because we're making it for, for others, but also because it's... Uh, Great pleasure for me. It happens to be my last day as the medical director after many, many years here. Oh, super and, uh, years. I mean, yeah, you just, you, you really, yeah. well, you, we've talked about yeah. one tiny fraction of what happened when yeah. you, under your watch, so it's great. But in many ways, this conversation represents the history of the University Hospital yeah. from its founding to, what is it, October 31st, uh, 2002. And, uh, <laughs> all that you accomplished uh, working here and uh, all that's going to be accomplished in the future. So, Scrib, thanks. Thank you. Yeah.